I live in a moldy species household. <laughs> this is my daughter, Kate, Catherine Rose. And there are lots of other non-human animals in our home. That's always been the case for me. I grew up on a ranch in Northern California, had the privilege of knowing many different kinds of animals, livestock, domestic animals, uh, and, and wildlife, and animals that were being rescued, animals that were work animals. Our dog, Boots, was indispensable in herding the sheep that we brought in every evening, unlike all of our neighbors who uh, allowed themselves to accept a certain level of mortality from coyotes and panthers and so on. Boots helped us bring the stock in at night. And of course, there was milking cows and all of the other kinds of stuff that happens on a ranch. So I think it kind of never occurred to me that animals did not have individual differences, that animals did not have levels of consciousness and, and so on. And when later on I went into training as a behavioral psychologist, what some people taught as behaviorism that seemed to completely ignore individuals, individual differences and consciousness and personality and all of those kinds of things. It really came home to me pretty quickly in all of that instruction that what we were doing in trying to scientifically study the mind or consciousness or whatever, what we were trying to do with behaviorism was things that could actually be done, that we could obtain, that we could obtain uh, objective information, reliable, consistent information, indicators that could inform our thoughts about consciousness. And I'll bet what Watson was saying, was recently quoted as saying, had to do with that. And that sort of approach to science has really been my approach all the way along. Appreciate every individual, of course. Learn from all of them. Uh, but there are times when you have to do the kinds of things that Kate was talking about. You have to actually count some things. You have to define some things. You have to be able to make some kind of graph. You have to be able to make some kind of prediction. So my topic assigned is to talk about mixed primate species groups. And I wasn't really quite sure how that should relate to laboratory animal situations. There are relationships, and I hope to tell you more about those. Um, but there are things that I learned in situations that were you know, applied situations that required me to try to make something happen um, that someone thought was important, um, from which I learned things that I never expected to learn. So are we talking about facilities that house different species in different species-specific enclosures? Are we talking about mixing species in individual cages in rooms? Because that has been considered taboo in some situations, even 
even has had regulatory uh, authority exercised on it? Are we talking about enclosures in which two or more species are housed in full contact? Kate talked a bit about full contact and its risks. Are we talking about something we might need to do in order to provide sociality, a social situation, because we don't have two compatible rhesus monkeys, but we have a leftover sino in the corner? Is there, is there a situation where we might want to pair those in order for them to both have the benefit of, of some social interaction? Now, I have Kate in my home, and that's very enriching to me. Coco Gorilla had kittens, and I think that was pretty enriching for her, maybe not so much for the kittens. Can we safely house primates of different species in multi-species groups? A lot of times when we come up to a question like that, we don't think we have any information. And that, and that was one of the things Bernie was talking about this morning. Goes to the literature for a particular topic and there are no publications that are meaningful. Well, um, this is one of those questions where we need to look further because, uh, at least at the time when I began working on this kind of problem, there was very little information. So can it be done? Yes, it can be done. Where has it been done? Why has it been done? All of these are issues that we can address here today. Are they natural? Are mixed species groups natural? Actually, there have been publications you know, more than 30 years ago <clears throat> documenting not only sympatric location of wild populations, different species, but actual mixed groups that were interacting with each other every day. In Africa, I think the first descriptions were from West Africa, some from East Africa, uh, then many more from South America. Mixed groups that you wouldn't even expect groups that complex for any of the species involved. Um, it's, not, it's not a predominant condition. It's a common enough condition that if we were to decide to take a trip today, we could go and within two or three days, if we wanted to go to such a place, uh, we would be able to see multi-species groups in nature. Are they healthy? They can be. We'll talk a little bit about what might be some of the benefits. Are they desirable? They're desirable enough in nature that they happen. That's probably the biggest criterion. What about in captivity? Well, that's another story. They may not be desirable. But we'll talk about some of the situations where this sort of thing has been attempted. And then beyond that, um, how it may relate to um, laboratory situations or something, something that an investigator at your institution might propose to do. There are, first of all, and I think uh, what we run, run into probably more than anything with regard to a regulatory context, is health concerns. What about uh, one species that hosts a virus that is potentially lethal to another one, like one of the simian hemorrhagic fevers that uh, potus monkeys host but doesn't seem to affect them, but if they are, if, if they are housed with another species, they might uh, transmit it to them and it might, might be fatal to them. Yet, potus monkeys have sometimes been housed in multi-species groups 
with vervets. This was done at, at uh, Bowman Gray uh, years ago. Compatibility issues, of course, are important whether you're talking about within species or across species. Here, I think our, our interest may be, especially on the enrichment value, could there, for example, be some value in housing squirrel monkeys and capuchins together in a situation where there is an interest in naturalistic behavior? And I can think of several places where that could be required by somebody, uh, some academician within a, a, a regular research institution. It's been done in zoos. What about regulatory compliance? Well, we're going to be hearing more from people who know more about this than I do, but ultimately what it seems to me like this issue comes down to is what the attending veterinarian is comfortable with or able to justify or what the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee will approve. So there are polyspecific primate groups in nature. I've mentioned some of the ones that exist and there are situations where people would like to do this in captivity, particularly zoos and particularly in the interest of conveying uh, conservation messages. First, let me mention a little bit about my background, uh, and some of this is in the bio, um, in the packet anyway, so I won't dwell on it too much. I was at UC Davis uh, California Primate Center for my graduate work, and there I worked specifically on pairing rhesus macaques. And the, the, the work was not intended just to inform laboratory animal care. It was intended for us to be able to learn more about um, the development of affectional patterns, social development in, in general, but more specifically in rhesus monkeys. Uh, I worked at the University of Washington Primate Center in their breeding colony, more about that later, then at Humboldt State University where I started a field station and I was curator of primates for Chicago Zoological Society where I had to apply this matter of multi-species primate housing, not just primates even. Um, Later on, I worked at National Geographic as a scientific editor and left there to work for BioQual, an NIH contractor. And they do mostly um, infectious disease research and most of the protocols at the time that I became affiliated with them, most of the protocols required individual housing, some of it biocontainment housing. I've been retired for more than 10 years, but I continue to consult, especially with BioQual, but also with a number of architectural firms and so on for design of facilities and some zoos. My species experience has ranged pretty broadly and it's mentioned in my bio that I've worked with more than 35 primate species. This includes also observing a lot of different kinds of primates in the wild. And that's something I recommend to everyone who works with primates in captivity. You see rhesus monkeys in the wild or free ranging in Morgan Island or Cayo Santiago or someplace like that. You see them exhibiting very rhesus-like behavior but this stuff happens in the lab also. Now, this, was a, this was a situation at California Primate Center 
uh, probably 1972, in which we were trying to make sure all of our rhesus monkeys were at least pair housed. There were already, I mean, this is way before 1980, not to, not to pick fights with anybody, but there were already at the time that I was at Davis a number of large half acre corrals with rhesus sino and bonnet macaque breeding groups. So there, was, there were some animals that were housed socially. There were also plenty of animals that were individually housed. In 1979, I published a book called uh, Captivity and Behavior, co-edited with my colleague, Terry Maple. And the reason I'm showing this picture, even though it's a very poor quality picture, is that it shows an interspecies situation. My colleague, Terry Maple, was doing his dissertation project on the development of social bonds between rhesus macaques and olive baboons. And he studied juveniles and he studied adults. And he saw a lot of affectional interaction, sexual behavior, and so on and measured responses to separation, which indicated very, very strong attachment responses. Um, interesting that the baboons showed a stronger response to separation than, than the macaques did. I think a lot of partnerships, a lot of social situations are not absolutely equal. You know, we do have, we do have data on paired animals, uh, rhesus, uh, showing that one member of the pair is just fine with it and the other pair and the other member is not in terms of elevated cortisol levels in one member. So some, something to consider. So I, I was at University of Washington at their breeding center and at that time, there were many, many, many groups of pigtailed macaques. One of our studies there of behavior, ag aggressive behavior in groups included 92 groups housed under identical um, spatial conditions. So I went from a situation where we were trying to make sure all of the all of the individually housed animals were socially housed into a situation where all of the animals were already housed in groups. And there's where I found out that there were some problems with that. Wounding rates and fatal wounds were very, very high. One year, in one year, there were, there were 70 pigtailed macaques who died from aggression, from trauma related to aggression. So it's not, it's not necessarily an easy thing. There were several groups of long-tailed macaques, some rhesus macaques, actually one, one group of rhesus macaques. They kept trying to increase the size of the group by adding females, and all that happened was that the females from the existing group killed the new ones. They either killed them or injured them so badly they had to be removed. There were Japanese macaques, socially housed. They seemed to be a stable group, and then from time to time, one of them would turn up dead. Usually aggressive trauma related. There were baboons, not so many um, injuries among the baboons. Pigtailed macaques are just terrific animals, and I've had, I've had the privilege of watching them in the wild in Borneo. They're just great. Long-tailed macaques, I appreciate them as individual animals, but many of them are pretty aggressive and not so easy to love. We did a series of studies um, 
of the effects of group composition, number of males per group, number of females per group, size of enclosure, that is, whether they had access to two adjoining rooms or access to only one. We found a number of just completely opposite to common sense results. Kate made that point earlier, and I think she also made the point very well that we should not be generalizing too broadly from any situation that we study in detail. It, it became clear that there was something about pigtailed macaques and something about the configuration of the environment that was leading and, and the size of the group, stability of group, things like that, that was leading to this pattern of, uh, of large amounts of aggression. We studied the problem almost to death, so many, so many studies. Uh, but when the recommendations based on that evidence were incorporated within the first year, the mortality rate dropped down to 11 deaths from 70. So the problem wasn't totally solved, but it was largely solved. When I went to Humboldt State University, there was a small departmental colony of, rhesus, of, of squirrel monkeys that was not uh, really used for much of anything, had been involved in some psychopharmacological projects, but mainly uh, my role with them was just to make sure that they were housed socially in a, in a reasonable group. Um, I developed a field station out in the wilderness near where I was raised. And the emphasis of this was largely on wildlife and fisheries biology, especially fisheries biology. But one of the things that was valuable for me out there was that I did some consulting for Bureau of Land Management. There's a very large area called the King Range National Conservation Area, a multi-use BLM administered uh, site. And they, one of their requirements was that they do a detailed wildlife management plan for every species found naturally in that area. Included spotted owl and various other kinds of things. But that was where I got the idea for regulation of laboratory primate facilities by creation of a management plan. And fortunately, Dale Schwindemann took that idea, put it in the regulations, and I think it, is, it can be a very effective device because it can consider the individual needs of each facility, the uses for which they have animals, the kinds of animals they have, what those animals are like, and so on. So I quickly burn out my time. <laughs> um, largely based on my experience at University of Washington and also this sort of field-oriented ecology center experience. I was hired as a curator of primates for the Chicago Zoological Society because they had a, an innovative new facility in which they were attempting to essentially recreate um, a naturalistic kind of multi-species situation and the message of Tropic World really was that destruction of habitat affects more than one more than a single species. So rather than just showing one species in an enclosure, you show a whole community. And that has ecological validity. This is uh, this is a, a picture of the African section of the Tropic World facility. In one side there are western lowland gorillas, in the other side 
There are a bunch of other primate species. There are a lot of, you can see some cages way back up in the back. Those are bird cages. There are many different species of birds in here also. Even a, a pygmy hippopotamus over in the area where the other primates are. Black and white colobus, talipoins, which are about the size, they're, they're a guenon that's about the size of a squirrel monkey. Uh, Schmidt spot-nosed monkey, uh, Kolb's monkey, mandrels, sooty mangabees, and sooty mangabees have some, some interest with regard to infectious disease because they, are, they host a lentivirus that is similar to the AIDS virus. And of course, mandrels do also. But at the time when we were doing this, we didn't even know, nobody knew about that stuff, you know. So it, it was a risky situation, but we didn't know the risks. Nevertheless, these animals were put into a common area every day and were called back into a holding area every afternoon. That worked. There was some interaction, and we'll talk about that in a little while. Um, each group had its own off-exhibit enclosure, and um, I mentioned here that there were artificial thunderstorms. Well, there were sprinklers overhead, and there would be flashing of lightning and thunder, and then the rain would come down. When that started, the black and white colobus would go off out of the canopy of artificial trees, would go off into a cave to get out of the rain. The talop ones would climb up the lianas and sit in the tops of the trees until the rainstorm was over and the black and white colobus would come back up and the talop ones would go back down and hang on to their, their little lianas. It was, uh, that's just an illustration of the interplay of interaction. There was closer social interaction that I'll talk about in a little while. Um, there was an Asian section. This is the Asian section. Down at the bottom of this, there was actually an artificial river where there were small clawed otters. We put fish in the river for the enrichment of the otters, but we did get some flack from the public who had sentiment for the fish. The sinos that were in the situation also went down and caught fish out of the river, so there was a little enrichment for the primates. However, the small clawed otters took issue with that and chased the long-tailed macaques up into the corner, and it was very interesting. We had never really expected that there, that there would be that sort of an interaction, particularly with the sinos. I mean, they're meaner than sin, and why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they be dominant over these little water animals? Well, I learned uh, when I was in Borneo and was watching some small small clawed otters. My guide told me, well, you won't believe this because nobody ever believes it when I tell them this, but one time when I was out here with some people, we were attacked by small clawed otters. <laughs> and I said, brother, I believe you. <laughs> one, of, one of the important uh, aspects of designing facilities where there is the potential for aggressive interaction, whether it's within or across species, is to make sure that there are plenty of escape routes. So within this complex, unsanitizable situation, uh, we made sure that there were lots of lianas and vines, a very, a very inexpensive way of enriching the situation. These are, are white-cheeked gibbons 
They are sexually dichromic. The males are black and the females are beige. There was also an area that was specifically for orangutans, and the orangutans were not supposed to be able to get out of that, and they never did. But none of the other primates were supposed to be able to get into where the orangutans were, but one of the male uh, white-cheeked gibbons went over there and interacted a lot with the orangutans, and a white-handed gibbon that also did the same sort of thing. It was quite a show, and I should move on rather than describing it in detail. But one of the points is that, the, that it is a natural kind of thing for primates of different species to interact in the wild. This is a, a picture taken in the wild in South India of a Hanuman langer and a bonnet macaque. In tropic world South America, we also had a complex situation. That's a spider monkey up in the top of the tree. And we also had in that same area full contact exposure, capuchins, squirrel monkeys, and in an area set aside for themselves, uh, golden lion tamarins, and titi monkeys, and later on, calamicos, and several other species have been tried. I'm trying to get uh, the current curator of primates to help me develop kind of a matrix that will show all of the different kinds of species of primates that have been exposed to each other and the ones that are compatible and the ones that are not compatible. Um, I should mention in passing that I ran across a YouTube video recently in, I think it was, it's Bronx Zoo's Tropic House in which they emulated some of what was being done in tropic world Asia. They had small clawed otters and they had um, silvered leaf monkeys and maroon leaf monkeys. One of the maroon leaf monkeys was down too close to the edge trying to catch fish, I guess, and the small clawed otters grabbed him and killed him right in front of everybody and somebody with a video camera. So there are some risks. And of course the risks include zoonotic diseases which, I've, which I have referred to before. It's not just, not just being carriers, it's not just morbidity or mortality, but even passaging so that the nature of the virus and its virulence uh, could be changed by passaging. The big thing that we all worry about is fighting, wounding, and in some cases, predation. There are compatibility issues, and we've talked about trauma, but there are other compatibility issues. What happens if they are copulating across species? Well, when the three-month-old mandrel male was copulating with the adult female talapuan, probably no big risk to anybody. And besides that, by the time he was six months old, she wouldn't have anything more to do with him. He was, by that time, he was three times as big as she was. However, the mandrels and the mangabees regularly copulated all around in all combinations. <laughs> and one morning, there was a very, very funny looking Sooty Mangabe baby, or I should say, Sooty Mangabe female carrying around a very funny looking baby. No one had an idea that there could be this kind of crossing, and yet you can see that this was at least a viable individual. It turns out that what we were taught in school about the definition of species ain't necessarily so. And that comes 
in coming back to the lab situation, that really begins to come true when you start examining rhesus and sinus because there are huge areas in Southeast Asia where there's an intergrade population. And I suspect that there are some unscrupulous dealers out there who go into that area and sell those animals either as, as little rhesus or, <laughs> or, or uh, sinos depending on what the client wants. <laughs> But it isn't just limited, that kind of thing is not just limited to rhesus and sinos. Uh, there are intergrades in the wild between pigtails and sinos. There are some places, disturbed areas, where they are drawn into the same area and you can find a lot of intermediate individuals. There's a, a an Orangutan Reintroduction Center in Sabah, where there are a whole bunch of um, pigtail and longtail crosses. We studied our field work for about 20 years was with Sulawesi macaques, and there are six or seven typically recognized species of macaques on that island. At what we were doing was looking at the zones of potential intergradation, the population contact zones, and of the, of the possible contact zones that were studied, there was typically an intergrade zone of five to 10 kilometers, very narrow, and usually in a somewhat disturbed area, but the potential was there and we can talk more about the potential for crossing, but it is one of the risks of cross-species housing. Enrichment value is just, I think probably the main thing is that there's uh, <clears throat> some tendency for a greater range of stimulation than might be present with just conspecifics. In the wild, one can imagine that there would be an expanded sentinel value from animals of different species who have different sensory capabilities. So uh, in an area where there is predation, that could be a serious value. But since in captivity, you're not providing opportunities for, for predation, then that's probably not one of the values of doing this in, in captivity. As I mentioned before, and other people will address, there are regulatory compliance issues. The main thing is whether, whether it is a justifiable, um, whether it's a justifiable usage. It depends a lot on what kinds of uh, facility design you have, what the needs are of, of your facilities. Uh, if you have biocontainment situations, you have the potential for housing a number of different species in different biocontainment units. This is one that I designed at BioQual for chimpanzees to enable full contact social housing anytime a protocol allowed it. And that would allow good visualization anytime otherwise, and it worked very well. Um, I also designed a system of mobile modules which was intended to promote social housing of macaques and other smaller laboratory primates. And the main innovation of this was to put in lateral doors that allowed the an easy opportunity for pairing and socialization. The first iteration of this, uh, these were 9.0 square foot units, so that enabled each unit, each upper unit and each, upper, uh, each lower unit to contain a pair of animals. 
And so the dollar signs, you know, went rolling in the bean counter's eyes when they realized that by pair housing, they could double the capacity of the facility, which was leased on a square footage basis. You know, so coming up with some kinds of innovative ideas often has to make sense economically before anybody will take it seriously. So I'm saying that mixed species can be done, any of the kinds of things we've talked about, um, but it's, it, in a laboratory situation, it's really dependent upon whether, whether somebody wants to do it or not, whether they have a good reason to do it. I mentioned the, the notion that you might want to do it in some cases in order to provide companionship. But the critical thing and the feed into the next talk is you know, how, how the attending veterinarian feels about it. And uh, so of course, we want always to come up with evidence-based objective information that allow people to make decisions on a reasonable basis. Thank you.